Alright, so welcome back EDF fans. Now this is part two of the series on how to optimize your data flows in EDF when you are loading and reading data to and from Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Data Warehouse, also now known as Azure Synapse Analytics, although all parties refer to it as SQL DB. Alright, so I have primed my design surface and data flows with just a source and a sync here in my data factory. So we're going to continue on the path of where we were with part one where we loaded a SQL database from a loans CSV file. Let me show you what that database looks like. Now we ran this a bunch of times with some different, uh, first it was just a source and sync, some different data flows that were just source and, from source to sync, and then some data flows that were transforming data. Each time we modified or we added some more data, so we ended up with a <clears throat> schema that had 74 or so columns in it, and we have uh, 2.1 million rows in it. So the first data flow we're going to do is just as simple as that simple data flow from part one, although in this case instead of a CSV file we're going to use the Azure SQL database as our source. So this is the data set that has the definition of that database that we loaded from part one. So it's dbo.loans and here is the schema from that database. And we're not going to set any optimizations, we just want to run this one time to say how long it's going to take to sync that data into Azure SQL DW or Synapse Analytics. And in this case, we're just going to do auto mapping. So all of the columns that you see here in inspect, all 74 of them, which currently have the uh, data flow spark data type associated with it, will get transformed automatically for you into the SQL data types, and then we'll get loaded into the Azure SQL uh, data warehouse. And so let's go ahead and run this with no optimizations. Let's see how long it takes for us to do that. Now, also, by the way, I do have set on the sync is to allow inserts and recreate the table. So we're going to um, auto-generate that table, and I also have enable staging. When you enable staging, this will tell Data Factory to use Polybase when loading data into the SQL DW. So you'll set that in the pipeline, so you're in the pipe, and this is where I will set my Polybase right here. So I'm using my storage account. Let's go ahead and execute this in the background so we can get it started. Now with no optimizations, we'll see how long it takes to generate that new table with the schema from SQL database into Azure SQL DW. I'm just kind of stepping back for one second. You can go back into the first part of this video to, where I talk a little bit about the details of setting the compute environment that you use, which is always a very sort of macro, simple way to adjust the performance that you receive on your data flows within Data Factory. Is it says set the Azure integration runtime, where that is where you can set the configuration of how much compute power you give to the Spark environment for the database cluster that is spun up to execute your data flows. So in my case, I'm using my Azure integration runtime called Dataflow Cluster here for this debug session. And so as I'm running this, this is using a cluster of memory optimized compute with 80 cores, 80 cores. So keep that in mind, we're gonna use that number of 80 cores for setting uh, partitioning later on to optimize this. Right now we're just using all defaults and now I'll go back into pause mode and I'll come back when it's ready. Okay, we're back and the data flow completed. So I'm looking at details of the uh, execution of the data flow and it really had the two transformations this is very very simple no transformation in between the loading and the writing now the since these are the only things I have on my uh, design surface and I'm not setting any sort of partitioning optimizations here everything ran with what's known as a single stage and the single stage took two minutes and three seconds while in spark so that means that we were able to read out the 2.1 million rows out of my Azure SQL database in two minutes. Now, if you click on the sync, what you see the rest of the, is that the rest of the time was spent in the processing of the data at the sync. So essentially the IO of writing that data out to Azure SQL Data Warehouse took almost four minutes. And we're doing that through a couple of things. There's the data definition language of the uh, that, that's executed to uh, create the table. That was the recreate of the table. And then there was the polybase uh, the writing of the data out to staging and the polybase loading the data into the do target table. But you see that we only uh, use one partition. So everything was crammed into a single partition. All 2.1 million rows were crammed in there. So we could probably improve upon this. Let's see if we can do that without adding, before we add any more transformations. So what you can do is let's go into that data flow. You can double click there to make sure you have the data flow that you want on your pipeline. And you see we're not setting any, any of the optimizations. Now remember I came back and I told you that we have a uh, debug cluster that is running a configuration for my Azure integration runtime of 80 cores, memory optimized compute. So I'm going to go into optimize, I'm going to take advantage of that. Let's set the partition for partitioning within that source Azure SQL database. Remember I said that I'm using a 
configuration of an Azure IR that has 80 cores of memory optimized compute for my debug session. So I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to set my number of partitions to 80. And I know a little bit about my data. So I know that I have high cardinality of my ID column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that as my source optimization for partitioning with 80 partitions. Now, if you don't know that much about your data, you can always just use round robin and then ask for the number of partitions out of data factory that you like. And we can distribute that data evenly using just a round robin strategy for that. Now, on the sync, let's set some optimizations on here as well. Let's set partitioning here. We don't have, of course, that source optimization here. So instead, I'll use partitioning of hash. So we know that ha the ID is what we're using. We can hash that. And let's do 80 partitions on there as well. Take advantage of the number of cores that we have on our computes for this session. Let's go back to the pipeline. And we can rerun this. Now, I have recreate table set on the sync. So Data Factory will recreate the table, so run the DDL and the DML, as well as use Polybase to stage the data and then move the, the data into the new table. So let's let this run and come back and see how long it takes now, see if we can improve upon that five plus minutes to load the 2.1 million rows. And the ink timer went off, and so we're done, and it only took four minutes. So we saved about a minute in processing by adding the source optimization for the ID column on the SQL DB source, and on the SQL DW sync, I added the hash partitioning. Both times I used 80 partitions, and I did that based upon the number of cores in my compute environment. Let's take a look deeper into the data flow. Now you can see that we have nice distribution of data across 80 partitions and the single partition we were stuck with the first execution, which breaks up the source to sync to different stages and allows us to optimize the reading of the data to just two minutes and the writing of just eight seconds. This all is what occurred in Spark and data frames very, very fast. And then on the sync side, it still took the three plus minutes to execute based on the driver in the IO of the database, which is natural because it's creating the table, staging and moving the data into DW. Okay, so that's optimizing for just source to sync, but it's a very simple move over to this one here now. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add an aggregate. So an aggregate is going to create a situation where you have your data distributed 80 ways, but sometimes when you aggregate, that actually is a little bit less optimal for an aggregation because the data needs to come together to a single place. So I've added an aggregate in which I am going to group by grade. So grade is the grading of the loans. So there's like A, B, C, D, etc. So we're going to group by those grades. And what I want to do is I'm going to total the total amount that we have, sum it up based upon those grades. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back the ID column so I can join this data back and get all the columns. Because remember, when you aggregate in SQL or in um, Azure Data Factory, what happens is all the columns that are not part of the aggregate are lost because you are aggregating. So you create the, the self-join pattern. And I do that here by having a, a new branch. And I call that new branch as original data. And then this is the branch that I'm using the aggregate down here. I join the data back with a join, with a left outer join, and now I have all my columns back. And then I have a dedupe here. This is my select, calling it column dedupe, so I can take away the duplicate columns because I'm doing a self-join. I don't want any duplicate columns. All the data is going to land into the sync. So the way the data is going to be shaped now, let's look at the inspect, is that we're going to have all the original 74 columns plus one new one. So we're going to have 75, and the new one is going to be the, um, the total uh, loan amount that I'm calculating in the aggregate right there. Now in terms of rows, we're going to be consolidating this down into the rows that are just the aggregates, or essentially the unique values of the grading per those loan types. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Let's see how long this aggregation takes now that we have some transformations in here. So we go over to our pipeline. We can use the same test pipeline we were using earlier, and we just changed this to be SQL Perf 2, which is the data flow that we're looking at right here. You can always check it just by double clicking on the activity and see that you are pointing to the right correct data flow. We can go ahead and debug this. and Let's see how long it takes to do the same thing. Again, this is, I still have the recreate table set in my sync. So this is going to, to recreate the table. Uh, run polybase and perform aggregation transformations on the data for data warehouse. Okay, we're back and this completed. So let's take a look at what happened here. So the stages were broken up into the um, into the source data at the top here, which was three minutes and three and a half minutes to get the data out of that Azure SQL database this time. So we did use the same partitioning in this data flow with the additional transformations and the same um, source transformation on the ID column. 
Then we get into the aggregate. So the aggregate was a step by itself. It's 140 milliseconds. What happens is uh, the, the data is sort of clumped up into different partitions. So what's interesting is when you're performing transformations as opposed to just moving data, in this case, because you're aggregating, the data has to come together into um, into partitions. And so you sort of lose the value of the partitioning across uh, that many uh, partitions with the aggregate. And then because we had everything else set to default or use current partitioning, what happens is as you go throughout the rest of the uh, data flow, you get that same partitioning skew. Let's say you get to the sink and you're writing the data and the sink took four minutes to write that data to write 2 million, 2.1 million rows plus the aggregation. And the reason why you see the skew at the end and throughout the rest of this is also because we're only writing, I think, uniqueness only from the aggregate group by of the grade. So what that means is important for you to know a bit about your data <clears throat> as well as the shape and the uh, contents of your data. So let's go into this data flow for one last time and let's optimize now. So we have the original source optimization at 80 here for the incoming data. So this is to read in and to aggregate the data within the data flow. But let's not do that. Let's just leave this at a current partitioning. In fact, uh, because we don't really need to, to leverage that, when we get to the aggregate, we really only need a single partition to create some um, economies of scale around the uh, data that is going to be uh, needed to be brought together for the aggregate. What we can do for the rest of this is we can leave these optimizations set as they are, and back then on the, um, on the sync, I'll also use current partitioning there, but there is one other optimization I want to do. On the join, we have this broadcast capability. I'm going to set the left aggregate to broadcast because there's only 19 or 21 rows it is on that stream. So that can uh, broadcast. What broadcast will do, it will take the data stream, push that, that data down into the nodes for processing for that join in Spark, in the Spark nodes. So it's very, very effective that way. So let's set those and we'll go ahead and run this again from the pipeline and then I'll come back to you when this is done. Okay, we're back and we completed in three minutes. So we took over two minutes off of the execution of this processing of these 2.1 million rows with those changes. Let's take a look at the details of the monitoring of the data flow. So back on the source where we had uh, changed this from uh, the 80 partitions across uh, the hash of the ID column, we instead just said use um, use default or use current partitioning. We were able to get the source read in in just under two minutes, that's very good. And then in the aggregate, because we're no longer spreading the data out across 80 partitions, we are now with one single partition for the aggregate, and the aggregate worked very, very fast as well. And what happens then is that is able to then uh, leverage the join with the broadcast capability to push those uh, 21 rows into memory and then do the lookup and do the join from there and the rest of the data flow then just uses that current partitioning and is able to sync the data in two minutes into Azure SQL DW. And so let's just take a look at the data so you can see real quick what that looks like. So we have those 21 rows and the data is all the columns brought back together with that total loan amount that I aggregated. And so just a quick recap on what we did in this data flow to optimize this set of transformations was to go back to current partitioning for the source, single partition for the aggregate, and then how we broadcast that into uh, the Spark node. That's it. Thanks for watching.